Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I uh, hope everybody's having uh, a great week. I hope that you had a great day today. Uh, obviously, I'm sitting back chilling and relaxing and I didn't want to miss out on today's installment of this week's series on the miseducation of black youth in America. Uh, before I get started again, I want to remind you of the importance of supporting the work that we do at uh, the Odyssey Project, whether it be research uh, in our research center uh, with thousands upon thousands of hours of research done. I myself alone have conducted uh, 80,000 hours at this point of research uh, directly related to the enigmatic issues that we face as a race and community. Um, our uh, think tank, our program development, uh, our program implementation and social engagement, social work, uh, mental health for black men and women and children. Uh, I have teenagers that I currently work with. I have young black women, young black men uh, that I am currently working with. Um, this is a monumental endeavor, but yet we push on. We do need your support. So this week has been a... Uh, series on the miseducation of black youth in America. Uh, before I get started, I think it's important to once again iterate my definition of uh, education and what it means to educate black youth so that what I share with you makes sense. I think that uh, the first failure in understanding the dynamic of education is the fact that we assume uh, the acquisition of academic skills is the culmination of educating a child and we fall so far short because it's not even close. Uh, education is so much more than the accumulation of academic skills. Education begins at the point of engagement in parenting and creating social environments and establishing values, interests, principles, ideologies, and a sense of self that will be cultivated over time. Uh, the ultimate definition of education is the preparation and empowerment of youth to grow up and become adults that go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete, but win. Uh, that, uh, that's applicable specifically to our black youth. With that being said, I wanna talk to you about something specific uh, I often talk to you about Black Men Lead. I talk to you about the importance of a rite of passage initiative. Um, this all emerged initially from my study of uh, African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. Uh, there's this need to understand why there's violence. Now, obviously, from a penology and criminology perspective, violence is going to be present um, Violence is going to be present in uh, any community where poverty is prevalent. And so we have to understand that where there's poverty, there will be criminality. Where there's criminality, there will be violence. And so we have to understand some of this has to be addressed from a socioeconomic perspective. But then what is this proclivity towards violence? Why does there seem to be a, a hyper uh a proclivity towards violent behavior. Um, and I think that we need to make it first clear that this isn't a racial phenomenon. This isn't um, exclusive to uh, the black experiences. It's exclusive to a type of reality. And so what I had to learn is one of the biggest problems that we have is that we don't properly socialize our males. Now, while I'm talking in specific about black males, understand that this also applies to our baby girls, uh, but in a different way. And I'm going to explain that over the course of these series that I'm going to be doing weekly, uh, the importance of socializing and creating the proper identity for both male and female. Today, I want to talk specifically about this disruptive behavior that we tend to see in uh, late preteens, early teens, mid teens, and on, and why? Well, you gotta understand, we love to talk about manhood and because the 
system tends to define manhood simply by being an adult. We normally look as at an adult as the becoming an adult as being the definition or defining moment of manhood. Well, the reason that so many other groups that thrive have rites of passage is they understand that manhood is something that's de developed and it starts early in life because it is the culmination of a process. And so what we see when we talk about disruptive behavior, uh, what we need to understand is the average rite of passage culminates or comes to an end uh, roughly around 12. There's a celebration for the Jews. We see the bar mitzvah and there's other, other things. But um, right around 12, then 13, there's this process where there's a development. There's a, a slow process of handing over responsibility, raising accountability, the more demands uh, and standards. We're not saying you are ready to run a home. We're saying that you need to start assuming an identity that is reflective of who you're going to become. And that's given to them through this socialization process. And it's cultivated and supported in them during their adolescent years. Here's the problem. The only real difference that we can find neurologically, emotionally, or psychologically within the minds and realities of young black males or any male of that nature, but we're talking specifically of young black males, the only difference that we can find in any of those areas uh, that are distinct or in some way different is the sense of identity a sense of self, a sense of wellness. And, and there's, there, there's a specific lack of identity in the place of uh, male uh, ideology or male uh, awareness of values, interests, and principles or guiding uh, principles are, are that, that govern who we are. So a sense of self, a sense of relationship with God, a sense of responsibility, a sense of uh, awareness of career. Who am I going to be? What am I becoming? What is my responsibility? How am I to establish? When there is a clear sense of self, when there is a clear understanding of the values you hold, when you have a clear insight of your career path, or at least what your passion or desire is career-wise, when you have a strong faith foundation, when you understand ethical boundaries that you are going to be held accountable uh, to, there is this sense of stability where we don't see a proclivity towards violence, where we see the disruptive behavior consistently is uh, in the area of an unsure or confused ideology and philosophy around who they are as a male. How do they identify themselves? What are their values? What are their interests? What are the principles that will govern their lifestyles? And when we don't have that because we haven't systematically established it, one of the biggest problems we have when it comes to black men is there is no universal definition of manhood. There is nothing that we can systematically measure one, one another by so that we can look at one another as men and say, hey, brother, you're falling on this area. You're slipping on this area. You need to do this. It's every man identifying himself primarily by his strengths. So he if he if he if he's a high earner, he identifies himself with a bank account. If he is, uh, you know, in great shape, he identifies himself through his physical attraction. If he is a kind person, then he identifies heavily with his ability to care for others. And all of these things are actually a part of his total appeal. But because he isn't systematically, universally, and from a place of community held responsible for all these things, he tends to gravitate and identify. And so nobody is being pushed and held to a standard. So that's the first thing. Now, what we find uh, universally, generally speaking, regardless of race, is that young young boys start to really truly search themselves and come into their sense of individualism and their individual identities as males and what they are going to be and become as men roughly around the age of 14, 15. Uh, what we find a lot with young black males is because of so much disruption, uh, so much uh, uh, 
social upheaval, uh, the lack of in many in many inner city homes of a male present uh, presence. And we talk about uh, mass incarceration. We talk about so many other things that are contributing to the 1.5 million men missing in the inner city. So uh, then what we have is um, a situation where a lot of black males are actually being pushed into this uh, state of self-discovery sometimes earlier. Uh, so prematurely, they are searching themselves to determine who they are. And this uh, emotionally, mental and psychological confusion as to who they are actually creates the disruptive behavior. And we see it. And so, again, uh, I've talked about it so many times, the five different contributing factors to African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. Um, number five is urban hassle. What is urban hassle? Urban hassle is what you see in inner cities. Um, inner cities, uh, you're going to find uh, children who are having to na navigate violence to get to school, gang violence to get to school, drug use to get to school. Um, they are dealing with uh, uh, inner city issues of poverty. They get gunfire uh, throughout the night, sirens throughout the night, um, just just different things. If you're in the uh, Northeast or Midwest, L trains uh, all times of the night. Uh, just different things that actually put a kid's neurological system on edge. That increases their edginess, that increases their agitation, it increases their proclivity towards violence. Number four is witnessing violence. The more you witness anything, no matter how horrific, the more desensitized you become. And so witnessing violence... Uh, does a couple of things. It desensitizes you to the horror and the devastation of violence. It also uh, normalizes violence and it, it presents it as a solution to certain problems. The next is being a victim of violence. Being a victim of violence increases the risk of actually at some point committing violence. Number two, second most prevalent influence, lack of proper racial socialization. Uh, that is the development of an understanding of who you are, your place in the world. And it doesn't start when you get when you become 15. It starts at three and four years old. That's why we do our rite of passage beginning at four. Why? Because at four, we start telling you what men do. We start showing you what men do by allowing you to hang around and be around men. We display it through our actions. We model it for you so that you can see it because a great deal of social development is not by way of what you are instructed verbally. It is through social, social learning theory, which is, in essence, the observation and uh, of someone doing it and then the emulation of what is observed. So then what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, the need to have young black males uh, witness manhood being modeled. In order for that to happen, they have to be in the presence of men who are modeling it correctly. If the men there in the presence are, are mistreating women, being misogynistic, being highly sexu sexual towards women, uh, being violent towards one another, criminal activity, they will emulate and aspire to, and they will not have a true sense of self and discovery. Here, here's where it gets very interesting. Okay, so say we get to... Uh, 13, 14, 15, where they are, they are starting to really experience, experience these disruptions and starting to really become problematic in school. And now they're being alienated from school and understanding that once they are alienated from school and they decide they don't want to deal with it anymore because they don't feel like they belong and they drop out, they are what? Five times more likely to become incarcerated. Okay, so we there now. What you have to understand is our boys are already in an environment where statistics say that they are seven times more likely to be convicted of a murder they did not commit. While they make up six percent of the population in this country, they make up forty percent of the prison population, and it's by design. So what 
are we to do? We have to understand what they're up against and we have to prepare them for that. That's a part of the socialization. You can't have them expecting that they can experience life from the same plane or the same expectations as young white males or young Asian males because they aren't viewed the same, they are not treated the same. They are going to be dealt with and viewed differently and there's a way that they can manage themselves and handle themselves and know it's not fair. But unfortunately, we live in a world where life isn't fair. One of the worst things that you can sit up and do is to give a child the idea that life is about fairness, that they should be looking for. What you should be giving them is a sense of confidence in themselves that says even when things are unfair, you can prevail. Even when things are unfair, you have the capacity within yourself to overcome it. Your job is to overcome adversity. Your job is to win and thrive in difficult situations, not look for the easy way out, not whine and cry about what people are doing because you can't control that. But what happens is we look at a system that is operating and working against them. So even if they are not doing anything wrong, the chances of them having a negative encounter with law enforcement is as much as six to seven times higher than if they were white. So what, what does that mean? That means that we have to function and operate on a completely different level. We have to carry ourselves in the group. Look at the uh, Central Park Five. That's just a microcosm of what black males and, and even uh, Latino males face. So then what, 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 what must we do? We must prepare them because what we have to understand is they're, the more they have a sense of self, the more they have a sense of identity, the more they have a sense of awareness of who they are, the more they strive for who they are, the better they behave, the better they carry themselves. Not just because they are striving to accomplish something, there is no disruption in their psyche when they know who they are. When they don't know who they are, there's a disturbance, there's a disruption, there's a frustration because the confusion uh, that exists in philosophy, in, 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 in ethics, in, 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 in religion, in, in, in career decision, in what it means to be a man, what they're going to do as a man, what their responsibility is in love and marriage. All these things are part of their self-awareness, self-identity. And when they don't have it, it creates a disruption and a confusion as to what they should be doing and how they should behave. And in that disruption, they do acts and commit acts and things that cause them to get caught up in the system. And it gets worse because now they're confused the ideologies they are functioning through are not pro-social and received or perceived well within the social structure. And what they're told, you're bad, you're horrible, you're, you're, you're pitiful, you're pathetic, or you're, you, all these things. And so now there's a little guilt trip because the feeling of uh, being a wrongdoer actually works again to create a false sense of self. And so now they start to identify and then there is this behavior that comes along with that. And so we are leaving them to themselves to uh, literally navigate through one of the most challenging times of their development. And we have to understand that at 15, they haven't fully developed. They haven't fully neurologically, emotionally, psychologically matured. And so literally on a physical level, the brain hasn't finished maturing yet. And so the idea that they can make the right choices, especially without guidance, is a problem. So these guiding principles that they are searching themselves for but have no anchor in is because we failed in our responsibility to provide uh, the proper socialization. And it's important with young black males and young black females to provide racial socialization. Uh, and if you ask me, what's the difference between socialization and racial socialization? Socialization uh, is a practice that every parent, every good parent does regardless of race. You're beautiful. You're smart. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. You can go to school and do anything. You are going to be remarkable. You're going to be exceptional. You all these different things, right? That's socialization. That is giving them a sense of self, giving them a sense of confidence, giving them a sense of direction, setting ethical and moral moral uh, 
parameters and boundaries that they are not supposed to violate and come out of uh, and all of these different things. That's proper socialization. Proper racial socialization comes specifically when you're talking about blacks and sometimes with other uh, other ethnicities, depending on where you're at, but in America, specifically black, why? Because all of these things that you just told them about yourself, you're smart, you're beautiful, you, you're handsome, you can do anything you want. When they, The moment they walk out and they walk into an environment where you're not in control, they're most likely walking into an environment that's going to co totally counter or contradict what you've told them. So then you've got to tell them that because you're black you're going, and, and, and you're competing for a job, or because you're black, you go in, you're going to have to be three times better than the white man that you're competing for the job against because it's stacked against you and but 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 understand that you have everything inside of you to be three times better you've got to really put it in their head that you can't let it anchor them that race is one of the things that i did not allow my children to do is to complain about uh teacher being racist now it didn't mean that they couldn't tell me what the teacher was doing they couldn't use that teacher as an excuse for why they weren't performing now, they were to tell me if this teacher did something to them, I want to know. And it was my responsibility as their father to go in and deal with that teacher. And I answered the bell each and every time. Not my baby, male or female, not mine. I'm going to show up and I'm going to let you know this is one black father that's going to be here. And so but same time is I, I don't want to hear it. the reason I didn't get it done was this teacher and she was picking on. No, tell me. You turned in your work and you feel it got graded wrong. Don't give me a, a, a complaint about she's racist, but you didn't turn in the work. You've got to give me something to fight with and I'll ride all the way out with you. So what it is, is about accountability. Why? Because you're going to have these same people when you grow up and you start lo looking and start, whether you work for someone else or you start a business you are going to have people who are going to judge you solely based off of your blackness. And that can't be an excuse for you not to not to succeed. And then I walked it out for them in life. They saw me every morning get up and run my business. They saw me every morning get up and handle situations. They saw me every morning get up and make sure that they had what they needed. And that is modeling it. They saw how I handled their mom. All of these things are a part of this process, but we're missing out on it. So instead of judging, and this is a part of it, this is more of a part of education than the attainment of academic skills. Because if a man understands who he is, if a young boy at 14 and 15, when he's coming into this part of the self-discovery and in his individualized self and his sense of purpose, his sense of direction, if he knows who he is, he will create the path to the skill set that allows him to be the best version of himself. And it's not always college. He may decide to be a mechanic. He may decide to be an artist. I have a client that's in Italy right now and under 30 and living on his own and making, make, making his way because he pursued a passion. He gave it all he got. He found his identity and he, 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 he got it done. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we have a responsibility to these young men to provide them with a clear sense of what it means to be a black man, first and foremost, early in life. Then we we teach it to them. We teach them the principles. The first principle we teach them at Black Men Lead is a black man does not bring harm to a black woman or a black female. And note, whether it's physical, emotional, or psychological, we do not harm our women. Doesn't mean we allow ourselves to be bounced around and moved around. It simply means that we understand that we are protectors even before we are providers. And we are providers. We are protectors. We are providers. We are promoters of our family. We elevate, we lift, we edify our family and so much more. So then the question then becomes, what do we do? We are going to have to have uh, agendas. We're going to have to create uh an expansion. Uh, one of the things that I've been pushing for so long is the expansion of um, Black Man Lead to make it a national universal rite of passage to get together with black men and determine and establish a universal definition and standards of behavior and performance for black men so that we can measure for ourselves if we are doing what we should be doing in our communities. This is absolutely imperative. And so my challenge is it's up to us 
to educate our youth. It's up to us to prepare them. It's up to us to deal with this issue with black manhood. And so on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get off of here um, and finish winding down for the day. Again, I'm going to ask you to support the work we do. It is so important, especially at this time. We need to create a generation of young black men who know they are. We need to create a generation of young black women who are operating under the security and safety of a community and an environment we created so that they can flourish in their gifts and who they are. We have lost ourselves. And because we've lost ourselves, our youth have uh, developed uh, warped senses of self that don't work for them, that put them in uh, precarious situations that don't uh, bode well. It's our responsibility. So again, I'm gonna challenge you, show some love, show some support for the work we do in other programs that are doing the same. Uh, as far as supporting us, look in the description box. We need your support more now than ever. Look in the description box, look and determine whether you wanna give. You can give through the organization's cash app, you can give uh, through GoFundMe, even though that's not my favorite uh, because of the processing fee and everything, but some people prefer it. Or you can give through the organization's direct giving link where it's processed through my processor. Uh, and either way, we need your support. Um, this is the part, uh, part five and part six but it's just gonna be one because I'm just gonna upload it. I don't feel like going through the whole thing. So this is day three's installment. We'll just put it that way. And on that note, I'm gonna get off here. I wanna thank you guys for letting me drop in on you. You have an unbelievable day and I will see you guys on tomorrow.